Okay. Let's do this. Another day, another painting. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski and Today we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists. Today we're going to be looking at one of the greatest artists from her period of time, the late 18 or 1700s and and early 1800s. We're going to be looking at the art of Elizabeth Louise Viget Lebrun and this portrait of her daughter Julie looking in a mirror. And I'm really excited because Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun is is arguably the the greatest female artist of during her entire lifetime, really. Um, and I I don't know why it's taken so long for us to to get around to 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 painting a portrait. By her, I think one of the reasons that it's taken a little while to for me to get around to making a painting by this great artist is a lot of her paintings are pretty complex. They're she's a, a really renowned for her portraits and their exquisite detailed portraits. We'll take a look at them here in a moment. Today's episode, just letting you know, is is going to take a little bit of time. It's not going to surprise me if we climb over four hours of painting. And if this is one of the most simple paintings I think we could have chosen for her. So I'm really excited. Let's dive into the plan of attack for today. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna get some paint on the canvas, or sorry, we're gonna, we're gonna get the image onto the canvas. <laughs> that's our first step. Then we're gonna stain the canvas with some color. That's imprimatur. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about Lebrun's biography. What an exceptional, as I was doing research on her, I was thinking, man, this would make for an incredible movie, right? Just an incredible biography. And then we're going to start on the painting itself. We might do a little bit of underpainting, especially on the face and the arms. Um, then we're going to start work. We'll probably do the background ideally in one pass and then spend the remainder of time, about three hours on her body and probably mostly on the, the two faces because there's, there's a foreground, there's a, a face in the mirror and her own face. Now, again, just if you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, hit the notification bell so you know when future episodes are coming and also join the Facebook group. There's a link in the description below. I encourage you to join it, take a photograph of the artwork you've made and upload it to the Facebook group. Okay, are you ready? Let's get this painting onto, or the drawing itself, onto the canvas. So, there is, this is the original. I've also done an outline, which you can download for free, and I'm a, in a second I'll show you how to transfer it onto the canvas. If you want to find it, there's a link to a Dropbox folder, again, in the description below, and in this Dropbox at the very top, if you're new to the channel, this is our, our intro painting um, classes right up here. Here's some of our easiest paintings right here. And then there's another 150 paintings that are much more complex, including today's painting, but there's like the Mona Lisa in here. Most of the most famous paintings of uh, mostly the past 200 years are in there, but there's again, there's a few older paintings like Titian, for instance. Um, but we are right here, 124th folder. Some of the, there's a few paintings we've done that are further down there anyway. This is where we are, you click in there, you're gonna three, see three files. There's the original painting and then two versions of the outline, a PDF and a JPEG, whatever's easier for you to print out. So I'm gonna, let's, I'm gonna play this video and we'll talk over it. So I'm gonna be painting onto a nine by 12 sized canvas board. Right, so I encourage, I, th these ones I like, I think they, then there's a link in the description below, you can order from Amazon. I have used some other ones I'm not such a fan of, so uh, these ones just seem to hold paint and they don't warp quite so much. And there are two dollars instead of the dollar one you get at the dollar store, right? And then I'm, I've printed out the outline from the Dropbox on my regular inkjet printer here at home. 
and then I'm just taping it down. You see I moved it a little bit further down just because there's a little bit of empty space at the top and it might be a little bit easier to fill that in than trying to kind of guess what the dress looks like at the bottom since our canvas is just a little bit bigger than the the uh, uh, outline. Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to speed through this in a moment. I just, I'm using a ruler just to quickly do some of the lines on the frame. Um, but otherwise, the rest of it is pretty straightforward. Now there's a lot of lines that I put in my outline. Stuff like in the hair, I would just sort of do maybe every third hair. We're, I'll show you here, that's kind of what it looks like here. So you don't have to do every detail. You can see I'm what I'm doing there is just trying to make sure I've got like the, the her bangs, like the, her hairline, like how far down does that come? And I think that's probably good enough. And there we go. Once you're all done, I'd like just to peel that tape off and then I save my outline here so that I can refer to it. Often it's just a little bit off screen in front of me and I can kind of just look at it because sometimes it's easier to do that than looking at the painting itself, right? Okay, and just as a, again, I mentioned the Facebook group, uh, where is that? Again, that Facebook group, I encourage you to join it. There was a great question here. I'll just mention the top. Holly um, said, let me, well, we can just read this comment here because it says, disheartened, what would you say if your partner said in a group of friends how proud they are of your painting progress and then said how disappointed he would be if he ever thought I traced or used a projector because Van Gogh or Rembrandt didn't use them? I came down and I put my graphite paper in a drawer, one he will hopefully never open. Oh, right, that's pretty disappointing. I can totally understand that. Let's talk about this as we go because I think there's... I can even sort of give a comment that would be directed directly to your partner. So um, just I'll remember to come back to that because that's something that definitely comes up after having done the outline process for some people who claim it's cheating. Uh, and there was also some great comments there in the in the on that that post, which is another great reason to join the group because there's a lot of people who, who know just as much, if not more than I do about painting and uh, great resource, a great place to uh, celebrate and commiserate as well. Okay, so once we've got our outline here on the canvas, let's do our next step. Okay, so the next step after we've got our underdrawing onto the canvas is we want to put some color on here. Now, some people will just go and start painting directly over the white and start painting in the face and the hands. You're certainly welcome to do that. I'm going to use the process that absolutely Vigée Lebrun would have used, which is to apply the imprimatura. The imprimatura is a method that the... the, the well, I mean, it's been around for probably a thousand years, but really popularized by the Renaissance painters. And that is to apply a stain of a color, often like a rusty red or brown, onto the surface and then paint. And especially portrait painters always did this. So I have no doubt she did this, but she's probably not going to use the color that, that I normally do. And if you're wondering what color do you normally use for this, this is the colors, this is the brand that I use, but you could certainly use lots of different brands. I'll show you here in a second. The color I use to stain the canvas is gonna be this warm yellow. It's kind of like a golden yellow. I just like that color because it gives everything that kind of Kodachrome glow, but you don't have to do that. You can also use a different paint. If you want a higher quality paint, this would be my recommendation, Golden. They're um, you know, a major, probably the largest acrylic paint brand in North America. And this Golden is probably the, the highest quality, probably, but also one of the more expensive ones too, right? Liquitex, they are also very popular. They have a professional grade. This is their student grade of paints. And again, you could see the same colors. They different names, but they're gonna be pretty close. Windsor & Newton also makes a good line of acrylics. 
uh, Artist Loft, which is owned by Michael's Art Supplies, a chain of uh, art stores. Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, and Dyler Rowney as well. And if there's another paint brand out there that you're using that I haven't mentioned here, I would love to know so that I can help find the colors that I would suggest you use for your brand of paint, right? Because there's, there's, I'm sure there's other brands out there. Okay, so let's get some color onto the canvas and the color that I put down rather than this rusty red color is my warm yellow. And it looks like I need to open a new tube. So, <laughs> probably, I would, it's interesting, I keep meaning to sort of make some sort of record of which paints I use most. I would probably say I go through white and yellow, warm yellow, more than any colors. Those would probably be the two colors I use the most. The color I use the least by far is black. Um, and because I like to mix my own black and we're gonna mix a black here shortly. So if you're, if you're new to the channel and you've never made your own, you're like, you can make a black out of primary colors, what? That's weird, I gotta tune in and watch this. <laughs> okay, so I put a little bit of water in here. Just as a reminder, you know, this is the only time I, I use water when I'm painting with acrylic. Um, because you just remember, water is how we clean our uh, brushes, right? So we really want to put as little water into acrylic paint as possible. Um, unless you're trying to do a stain like this. Um, or to clean your brushes. And the reason why also this is sort of acceptable is because I've also gessoed this canvas. Now this canvas comes pre-gessoed and um, and then I take it and I, I add more gesso to it. I've talked about this many times, especially in our intro, uh, the first five episodes of the class, uh, which are numbered in, in the playlist below. But uh, um, especially for a painting like this, having a few layers of gesso and then sanding them down is going to help give you the most smooth surface possible. And whenever you're painting uh, something that's got a lot of detail, and especially if you're trying to replicate a painting by, by a, an artist of the... Um, you know, the classical era, or although she was part of what we would call the, the Rococo or the neoclassical period, but, but you know, we compare it to the modern era, like Impressionism and above, or more recent, you generally, you want the smoothest surface, because that's going to make your life just so much easier. And Applying an aim premature like this is just another way to smooth the surface of your painting so that the paint just glides over the surface. One of the ways I was thinking just uh, this morning because we had an Easter egg hunt with uh, our daughter and my wife got waffles for all the kids and uh, I was thinking, oh, you know, Sanding your canvas down is, is the difference between paint, you know, putting butter on a waffle versus putting butter on a pancake, right? I'm sure if you've ever had a waffle before and tried to put butter on it, you get a quarter of the way across the waffle and all the butter has come off of your knife because of all the, the little um, uh, pockets on a waffle. Versus if you put butter on a pancake, it spreads pretty evenly because the surface is nice and smooth. So if we think about that as when we paint on a canvas that has a lot of texture, it's really hard to get those really nice flowing brush strokes because the weave of the canvas kind of sucks in all the paint off of your brush. Okay, so 
that is good. I've got a really nice even, that's like the most even imprimatur I think I've ever put down. That is, I'm surprised. That's, that's interesting. And if, if, for a painting like this, a portraiture, I probably, you saw I maybe put a little bit less water in than I do for some other paintings because this is going to be a really important foundational layer, especially when we come to the face, etc. Uh, because we're going to use this yellow as part of the the skin tones. Okay. So, while that's drying, let's talk a little bit about who today's artist is, or was, right? Um, although, you know, in my mind, she still lives on because of through her work. Okay. <laughs> so let's um let's take a look at her uh wikipedia page um so she was born in 1755 and dies in 1842 at the age of 86 most of the work in fact i would say 95 percent of the work that she is known for she did prior to maybe age 45. She did make art over the remainder 40 or so years of her life, but she definitely slowed down quite dramatically and was working more on writing and specifically her three volume autobiography because she had a, a lot of incredible experiences and I think she she recognized that it was going to, that it was she had a window into the, the the French royal family that very few other people actually had. So part of so her journals, her autobiography is um, seen as like a, a very important document in French history because of her, her very close relationship to Marie Antoinette, the very probably the most famous queen of France. So. Um, I think it's also just maybe right off the top here, they mentioned that she was considered part of the Rococo movement and then the neoclassical movement. Rococo is a fun word to say. <laughs> and Rococo is uh, or was a movement that happened at the end of the Baroque period, which itself comes after the Renaissance. So not to get too complicated about things, but you have like the Renaissance and that's your, and there's even within that you have the early and high Renaissance and, and, and late Renaissance, and then you have Baroque and then you have Rococo and then you have Neoclassicism. And after that, you might have, uh, I guess you probably go into Impressionism and then Post-Impressionism and somewhere in there you have the pre-Raphaelites and then you get into the avant-garde of cubism, fauvism, lenabi, futurism, constructivism, uh, supremacism, Russian supremacism, um, and then abstract expressionism and pop art and then postmodern art. That, that's, that's the <laughs> That's the short history of art right there in terms of movements. Um, oh, Romanticism. Thank you, Pascal. Yes, Romanticism kind of fits right there after Neoclassicism. And all these things kind of blur. I always think when I try to explain this, it's not like as if everyone said, Oh, what, the Rococo's over? Okay, let's uh, everybody close up shop. We're moving on to a new movement now. Everybody, we're, we're now Neoclassical art. You know, it's, that's not how, how things worked. You know, there's there's some in some cases some of those lines blurred for 50, 60 years, and some people, you know, and sometimes even these these names that we have for movements didn't really occur until maybe a hundred years later. I don't know if anyone in the Renaissance considered themselves. I, I'm just thinking off the top of my head as a Renaissance artist. I don't even know, but anyway, long story short, let's talk about this great artist. Um, Let's see. So she, her her mother was a hairdresser and her father was a, a portrait painter, although he used mostly pastels. And 
pastels at one point were quite a popular medium um, maybe less respected as um, as a material than oil paint was but still there were lots of great artists that used pastels and uh, probably a little bit more of a chalk pastel than oil pastels that I think are probably more well known and used by kids in elementary schools but anyway her father sort of imbued um, his love of art and his ability onto his daughter and um, she I think developed quite a, a, a strong relationship with her father his father or her father um, seems to have been like a, a pretty decent fellow and uh, especially after he passed away at when she was 12 years old I think that was a very traumatic period in her life especially because her father or her mother remarried and she detested this fellow that that uh, you know basically a seamlessly you know um, insinuated himself back into the family and literally walked around in her father's clothes and wore his shoes and all this kind of stuff which is just kind of bizarre right um but he was a wealthy jeweler had money and that allowed her to you know that sort of put the family into a little bit higher of a of a class and especially at this time in french history things were very stratified and it was very difficult for anyone to kind of go outside of their station in life and I think that's one of the things just historically interesting about artists is that they they're sort of able to sort of transcend those boundaries in a way that most other people just simply weren't allowed to do um, and that's still I think the case today where you have you know someone like I don't know Jay-Z or Beyonce who you know come from a less you know well-off family make billions of dollars and are now living in the most expensive areas of New York and Los Angeles right that that would have been unheard of back in those days but except for a few artists um, anyway so let me see what else to um, she's basically a self-taught artist as well I think that's really important to, to know and the fact that she was able to accomplish so much with by essentially teaching herself again she had her father who was an accomplished artist but her father died when she was 12 years old so and she was also um, raised for about half of that of her childhood by um, like in a by like back in the day um, you know again another quick tangent is children usually especially if you were of a, a kind of middle class which is where she was kind of stationed often weren't actually raised by the parents until they got to like uh, you know seven or eight years old often they'd be raised by a wet nurse or, or um, they'd be sent to like a convent or something especially girls boys a little bit different um, but anyway so she didn't really have that many that long of a period of spending with her father despite his talents but again I think after that the trauma of him dying and this other man moving into the house um, I think made that connection to art very important to her right because it was like sort of a some kind of tie back to her family to her father um uh just kind of skipping ahead here i think what's incredible ag again she achieved success really early by the age of 14 she is now a kind of a minor celebrity because of her ability of for portrait painting like i was thinking like what is that it, it, I was thinking maybe it's maybe something like Britney Spears or a, a pop musician in that all of a sudden is like the talk of the town everyone is like whoa you've got to check out this 14 year old girl she can make the most incredible painting so everyone is lining up to get their portrait painted by this young celebrity right and uh, that 
is really important because that sort of opens up many doors going forward, including she's admitted into the the Academy de Saint Luc, which is like very powerful organization. And really, being a painter at that time, you had to be a part of the Academy. In fact, I think at one point, like she was, uh, yeah, her studio was um, basically took all of her art supplies because if you weren't officially sanctioned as part of the Academy, you weren't allowed to paint. Right, it's sort of like a weird chicken and the egg thing there, but um, so and and you know, and it's it's almost like they treated it like you to be an electrician. You had to be certified by the electrical association of wherever, um, and so the fact that she's admitted into the academy at 19, which there were very few women that were allowed, especially someone who's not even 20 years old. So that, again, that right there just tells you, like, wow, she is really, really good at what she's doing, which would have been a, another thing that would have really irked a number of people. Like, how how is this girl able to do what all of us you know, 50 year old men can do, and she didn't go to school, she didn't, you know, uh, have any, you know, um, help besides her father for just a few years. How can she make these incredible paintings? This is just uh, some witchcraft, I'm not sure, even sure, right? So she, um, from there, that is just being in in the academy is now opens up even more doors because really without that certification you're not really allowed to practice and and that's really the main exhibition every at least there would be one major exhibition every year like a spring or a fall exhibition as part of the academy in these big what they call salons and we've talked about the salon many times because the salon was the thing that the impressionists revolted against. They created their own salon, the Salon des Indépendants, which was the independent salon that invited anybody who was rejected by the by the, by the academy to exhibit, right? That's a whole other story we've talked about. But as, as soon as she's got that um, certification, then she's, you know, she starts getting higher and higher um, profile clients, including eventually the, the young queen of France, Marie Antoinette, who they were born within months of one another. So they're the same age. They're both kind of outsiders. Marie Antoinette was from Austria and was sort of, you know, these arranged marriages brought from Austria to Paris to marry uh, Louis the 14th, I think. Is it the 14th or 16th? And... That would have, and she was Marie Antoinette was never accepted by the French aristocracy. She was just constantly being portrayed in these really negative ways in the, in the the whatever the press was at the time, and you know these like, you know chattering classes of people just constantly ridiculing her, and just I would this has also been documented in several movies, which a, a recent one called Marie Antoinette by Sofia Coppola, I think was that, who, I think it came out maybe ten years ago, starring Kirsten Dunst. Really great movie. I thought it was a really fun movie. It's kind of strange because they use like rock music instead of classical music, but uh, does a great job of sort of showing kind of the strangeness of that period, and. Uh, Vijay Lebrun becomes not uh, they they do spend a lot of time together it's sort of disputed as to how close of a friendship they had but for instance after uh, Vijay Lebrun would paint a portrait of Marie Antoinette they would spend the next few hours doing a, like a casual performance of music together um, Vijay Lebrun would sing while Marie Antoinette would play the harp and their mothers would sit and, and have tea and watch and you know that's 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 a pretty intimate kind of um, experience to share and I th so I think that there you know as much as the as was allowed for someone of a lower rank to to to, to spend time with the, the queen that happened Right, so I just you can just imagine again the things that she would have seen as a fly on the wall 
as what's going on in the palace, especially in this time, because there's growing discontent amongst the public in France, and which ultimately leads to the French Revolution. And the French Revolution is, uh, you know, just complete chaos, where there are, you know, it, from day to day, you have no idea who's really in charge, and some people are having they're being sent to the guillotine and and the people that are, that are giving the orders to have these people executed a week later they're the ones getting executed and then the week later those people who gave those orders they're being and so it's chaos eventually if famously uh, Marie Antoinette and her husband are um, uh, beheaded on the guillotine in the what's now known as the Place de Concorde in the center of Paris and uh, Vigée Lebrun, she and her mother and her daughter, who I've, I kind of skipped over that, they, they kind of escape, I think, like a, a, a maybe a, a year or so before. So, they're not, but, so they go into exile. They leave France because it is a very bad time to be associated with the wealthy upper classes because the French Revolution is all about sort of a people's uprising and there's this great resentment to especially Mary Antoinette is sort of the is becomes unfairly the symbol of um of the uh, the of how out of touch the the aristocracy is from the poor and that famous quote let them eat cake uh which you know we've is sort of been debunked as it doesn't really mean what what it's sort of how it comes across you know when she's told that the people are starving she's like, let them eat cake we can we'll go let's go into that maybe a little bit later but that's it i uh, people more recent historians have said well it's it's not as this aloof complete disconnected um comment as it might ordinarily appear but anyway while she's in ex so she goes into exile she expects to be gone for a few months and everything to kind of blow over while she's gone, Marie Antoinette is is executed, and she ends up being out of France for 13 years. And during this time, again, more and more chaos happens, and eventually Napoleon comes to the scene. And after a few years, again, um, by I think 18 or yeah, 1802, she's able to return to um, to to France. And she settles there, but during that 13 years, she basically, again, she's she's a celebrity, not just in France, but all over Europe, and there's still kings and queens in Germany, in, or what it becomes Germany, and England, and uh, uh, Russia, all sorts of uh, Italy, and so she basically is going around, spending time, like a year or two, in the royal family, like Holmes making portraits of all these other kings and queens. So which does give her this reputation uh, as being this, you know, the, there's sort of two sides to every, every coin. On one side, it's like, wow, she is like, you know, the, one of the most respected artists of her time because she has access to the most powerful people in Europe at this particular time there's also a whole other sort of side that people look at that and be like how out of touch she's just like she's making doilies for the rich you know they're just like there's no style or substance there's no creative thought she's you know it's and so I'll just put that out there because that's that's been sort of one of the things that over the course not just of her life but subsequently that people have used to put her down and I think there's probably a bit of sexism in there as well um, as because there were artists like Jacques Louis David who she knew and befriended remember Jacques Louis David did the famous I don't think I have it around here but the portrait of Napoleon that the one that we did was unfinished and there was another one of of Napoleon riding his horse through the Alps. Jacques Louis David, similar type of um, experience where he was, you know, part of the royal court 
he would have known Marie Antoinette and uh, the king. He also sort of he managed to stay in France and ride that wave all the way through and ultimately become like a a, a, a confidant and friend of Napoleon himself, right? So, you know, one of the one of the main differences I would say about between David and Vigée Lebrun is is David did a lot of these big history paintings of like the coronation of Napoleon and um, uh, Oath of the Horatii, like these 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 and the death of Socrates, death of Socrates, and anyway, just that was sort of history painting for has really always been considered to be the pinnacle of all art everything else is a lesser than and portrait painting would be sort of low lower rank right and women just weren't really allowed into that history painting sphere because they weren't allowed to paint directly from models usually male models so um it was uh yeah, I think that's another reason why David also kind of rode that out a little bit higher. Let's just see. Uh, what else do I want to mention? Uh, you know, let, actually, let's take a look at some of her painting. Again, you're going to see these are basically almost all portraits. So, um, let me just remember... So these dates, 1755, right? So this is a painting she made when she's 15 years old. I feel like this one I thought was made earlier because I thought that she did this one when she was 14. But either way, like, um, so this is saying she was like, what, seven. 18 years old when she did this. I, I'm sure she did that when she was younger. But you can see, like, these are the paintings that she's doing when she's, you know, <laughs> like a teenager. And she's just like a like a young rock star. I don't think it's, it's out of the range to compare her to someone like Britney Spears, uh, a, like a young woman who achieves, like, massive celebrity, you know, very at a young age. Um... This painting here is an infant. This painting probably caused the biggest scandal in France up until that time. This is Marie Antoinette in a muslin dress, and it is worth um, it's mentioned. It's worth just talking about it briefly because one of the things that Vigée Lebrun did um, is she was sort of a again. She's become quite famous, and she's a young woman. And that gave her a certain amount of power and prestige that maybe probably most other women, even even uh, Marie Antoinette herself, weren't really allowed. And one of the things that she did was she was sort of she was kind of a bit of a hipster. And she would dress in a in this sort of fairly casual way. Like this was a very casual dress, 250 years ago. Um, basically like a, this muslin kind of cotton material which is semi-transparent not too much different than a, than your t-shirt today uh, and that's what she painted um, uh, the portrait of Marie Antoinette in which was a scandal a massive scandal because people are like like are you kidding me the queen is is painting herself in basically underwear right because that's you would you would wear a clothing like that if if you were at home walking around the house or getting maybe ready for bed but you certainly would not have your portrait painted dressed like this and it's funny to look at and you're like really that's a scandal right so very this and this not only that she she submitted this painting for one of uh, the salons and it was exhibited and there was like outrage people were like they were gonna you know uh, not only you know a, you know I mean people were upset at at Vigée Lebrun for painting a painting like that but really more upset at uh, Marie Antoinette for allowing herself to be depicted in that way and shortly thereafter 
um, Vigée Le Brun replaced that portrait with this one. This painting is the one that I was contemplating doing today, but it is pretty complex because it's not only just Marie Antoinette, but there's flowers and a landscape, and it's like, wow, that's going to be tough. <laughs> so I was like, Let's, this one's got the simplest background of all. Um, but uh, what else do I want to say? Oh, here's another painting that um, was also quite scandalous, is that she painted herself, this is a self-portrait of herself with her daughter, but with her lips just slightly open so that we could see a little bit of her teeth, which again was a big no-no, right? And people aren't supposed to smile in a portrait, and they're certainly not supposed to smile and show their teeth. Like, are you kidding me? What kind of artist is like, oh my, and so again, these things just re seem ridiculous now, but that was sort of the, the, um, the, the times, right? What else can we say here before I move on? Um, you'll see that there's very few paintings that she does kind of after, you know, here's, you know, 1801. You know, she returns to France in between this period of time, and there's she really slows down her her painting um, to a, a trickle where she's basically mostly working the last forty years of her life on her her memoirs, um, which I have not read, but they are again a major source of of important source of information for historians on just what was happening in France at that particular period of time. Uh, I think so I just wanted to again this there was an exhibition of of the dress that uh, Marie Antoinette was wearing as well as some of the paintings at the National Gallery of Canada uh, years ago there's a couple of great there's a documentary by the BBC called the fabulous life of Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun portraitist of Marie Antoinette and the links are in the description below parts one and two each one's about 50 minutes at the very end of this it is interesting because they just talk about how just as she as Vigée Le Brun was was you know in her 80s photography is invented in in Paris really a few places simultaneously but the daguerreotype which is a very early way of making uh, photography is invented and it's just they sort of just talk about how she would have seen some of those images uh, produced and she, having been a portrait painter her whole life she writes about how th these photographs are so far inferior to painting that they're not able to capture the soul and the energy of someone they just sort of look lifeless because you have to remember to take a, a photograph of yourself in this period of time you would have to be hold still perfectly still not blink for maybe five minutes any movement would cause a blur so you really have to be really really still you know you have to be still when you're getting your portrait painted but I think one of the exceptional things with um, with uh, Vigée Le Brun is how she is able to kind of put people at ease while she's painting so if you're painting for four or five hours someone's sitting in a chair keeping them entertained while you're making their portrait is pretty tricky right because uh, most people don't don't like sitting still for that long right even back then okay so let's now move on we'll we'll start the painting this looks like our underpainting is is dried now that i've gone on for half an hour and uh so let's take a look here at the original and just think about if we want to do some underpainting how we would go about it i think I might do just a little bit on her eyes, um, maybe hand a little bit of that. That's so. Let's mix a black or a very dark color. Maybe we won't we won't go for the black just yet because there's no real need because everything we're about to paint is just going to get covered with paint anyway. So we just want something that's going to be dark enough to not disappear under subsequent coats. All right. So let's just put some paint on the palette again. If you just tuned in about half an hour ago I, I talked about the different 
names for these uh, or different brands that you can use and the different names that different brands use for different tubes of paint so that you could go out and buy these exact ones. And in a painting like this, I think we'll probably use almost all of the colors. Sometimes we don't. Um, but as I always say, like if you don't end up using all of your colors, then you can spread them onto a canvas like this in the style of Jay DeFeo and her famous painting, which this is based upon called The Rose. Right, which you can see at the LA County Museum of Art, one of the great um, paintings of uh, you know the 50s and 60s in American art history. Long ignored, but good to see that over the past few decades, Jay DeFeo. Just like Elizabeth Louise Vigée Lebrun has also sort of undergone a major uh, reevaluation as more and more people start to be like, there surely must have been one or two women artists out there. And then you find like, wow, there were thousands of them. They just, it turns out the history books have been written by men. So uh, they didn't, you know. Uh, really get any mention. Okay. Also, this device that I'm using, people often ask about this, is called the Tube Ringer. And I love this device. I love... It just gives me so much satisfaction seeing all this paint that otherwise would disappear into a landfill getting used. Okay, I see lots of familiar faces in the chat there. Pascal and Rachel and Donna. Awesome. Uh, what is it you guys are talking about receiving? I received mine today. Would I miss something? Um, okay. So let's mix our a dark color to get started. And I'll probably mix it over here. I think. Maybe I'll mix it over here. So I'm, what I'm going to do to make my black, I'm going to take some warm red and cool blue and mix these together. And together they're going to make a really dark purpley brown color, especially depending on how much of, of red and blue I put in here. But generally, like, this is a color most people might not want, right? But this is perfect for our purpose. And if you get a color, really, for our underpainting, it doesn't really matter how gorgeous of a color this is. I mean, there, there can be lots of uses for a color like this. So if you're, it's like a, basically an eggplant. But I don't think most... If you wanted a, a brighter purple, like, when you think of purple, you probably want cool blue and warm sorry warm blue and cool red together are going to make a really nice saturated purple and so we're going to kind of maybe use a little bit of this as well if we if to make a black um in fact let's just do that instead of me just explaining it let's take a bit of this cool yellow mix this into here and that color goes from purple into a dark gray not quite per totally totally black sometimes I do use black at the very end of a painting if I've got a lot of this because that black is just that one two percent darker and it just it, you know extends the possibilities just a little bit further anyway that's probably good enough I'm just gonna wipe my brush off Pascal, I ordered a couple things today. Brushes, a brush holder, you can roll.
Holly says, you started already. I thought it was at four. Uh, hopefully I put it as two on the YouTube page. But we're just getting started, Holly. We're just getting our um, underpainting begun here. So with our dark color and our canvas, we've already got stain. Let's take a little brush. And let's zoom in here. So mostly I just want to preserve her eyes. I'm just using this really so that I can, um, I don't lose the proportions of the face. Just her chin. Usually what I'm looking for is that because these are lines are darker, depending on how how thick of, of or opaque the subsequent layers of paint are going to be. I just don't want it to be too dark. Like you see, I didn't do the under um, her eyelids here because that's probably going to be very light, lightly done. Especially when you're drawing like a child's face, you want it's got to be pretty loose. Uh, you don't want to have too many lines on there because those lines are going to make someone look older, right? Maybe her bangs. Okay. I do. Th I I think the view two V was scheduled for three p.m. and I changed it this morning. So my apologies. And Now, if you make a, a quote unquote mistake at this stage, it's not a, that big of a deal because we're going to paint over everything here. This is going to make it easier so that later on I'm not like going, okay, now where, where exactly was the eye there? Like, ah, I wish I had preserved some of that. So this is what exactly what I'm doing right here. Maybe since her, maybe let's just, I'll put these side by side just so you can see. All right, maybe just a little bit behind her arms so that I can go put a big green here and just paint quite uh, casually over this area without losing that. Okay, I think. You know what, maybe... <clears throat> and I can, you know, I imagine some people are like, oh, how do you know where you want to put... 
I'm just thinking about like areas that's like for instance I might paint this all white and it might be nice just to be able to see a couple of major lines <coughs> excuse me uh, yeah I think that's good let's let's kind of end it there I see. So Pascal's talking about the tube ringer. <laughs> this thing here. I was like, oh, that's when you, I got mine today. Okay, the tube ringer. Not quite in focus. There. What does that say? Uh, something Mechanical Company. The Gill Mechanical Company from Eugene, Oregon. Okay. <laughs> so our next step here is to take care of the background so we want to put in some color here and then we may go back to the fort we'll, we'll just see how things go because ideally it'd be nice if we get the background done all at once and don't have to return to it although sometimes we've got to do a little bit of extra work that we didn't expect right that's just life so here We've got obviously some kind of a brown, but what I would probably, what would be easiest is if we can paint, you know, one brown and then sort of darken over top of it. We could, you, if you really were, you know, bold, you could try to do it all wet, which is a little bit more challenging with acrylic paint. So I'm just going to paint probably something a little bit in between here, and then we're going to darken over top of it. So let's mix a brown and let's go for a bit of a cooler brown. So to do our cool brown, let's do this right down here. So I'm gonna take my my uh, cool yellow again. Let's put this down here. I'm probably gonna need all of that. My cool yellow, and let's take some cool red. Mix this together, and we get a kind of a a more muted orange, right? If we mixed our warm yellow and our warm red together, we're gonna get more of a fire engine. Uh, orange whereas this one almost looks a little bit pastel like it's it's almost looks like we put a little bit of white in here right because they're further across the color wheel from one another so we're gonna not gonna have quite the same level of intensity so that's we got that started now let's take just a little bit of blue and mix this in here we start getting a cooler brown now you got to be careful if we put too much blue in here too much of the cool blue this is going to go very gray very quickly because we've got all these colors that are crossing over the near the the center of the color wheel with one another so we want to keep this predominantly red and yellow all right you see even when i put that little bit of blue in there how it kind of went kind of greenish really I mean that was just a barely any ah okay so let's just but the blue will darken it which is what I, I well, actually no that might be a little bit too dark let's see That looks much more orangey brown on screen than it does in life. That's weird. Let's take it just a little bit more blue. Just to darken it down just a bit more. I think that's that's gonna be good. It's it doesn't quite look exactly like we have. 
um, this is, it's almost like we're a little bit in between the two, the darker and the lighter, which is fine because I don't want to spend, sometimes I spend a long time on my backgrounds and I kind of want to move a little bit quicker, <laughs> right? It is a, a Saturday afternoon. So let's, I'm going to also put a little bit of matte medium in here. It's going to thin this paint ever so slightly. We've got this yellow on here that I don't want to just obliterate. And that warm yellow will also kind of help this brown stay brown rather than go uh, too dark. And we do see that color certainly. In fact, I'm going to put more in there. This, the, the warm yellow that we have on our canvas here, you can kind of see it kind of seeping through her painting here. So, um, because this area is going to get darker, this is a, you know, if you're ever in doubt of like a color you've painted, it's always probably advisable to paint in the darker area. And that way, if it doesn't look good, it's going to get darker anyway. And we'll just hide whatever quote unquote mistake you've made in underneath that dark color. The one thing when we use matte medium and mix this into the color, I have to find it, it speeds up the drying time a little bit. So we, it gives us less time to kind of play than we would certainly if we had a oil painting. So there's going to be a lot of streaks in this just because we added that, that medium, right? We're painting a much thinner paint. So, you know, if I was to think about like how she would have made a painting, I would suspect that she probably would do some sketches and then, um, so just have someone kind of just be pretty informally kind of just standing around and do some quick sketches to sort of get the pose correct and then might, um, then prime her canvas and get them to come back after she's maybe done a little bit of sketching on the canvas, a little bit of that underdrawing, and and then complete it with a little bit of underpainting on top of the underdrawing, and then she'd be off to the races. I don't like this kind of ridge that's there. So just gonna, almost kind of scraping that away, but I'm also in danger of, as this paint dries, of pulling up too much paint. That's pretty good for that. Oh, I forgot there's this area.
I am tempted to use the same brown for her hair, but I think I'll go for a bit of a warmer color for that. So what we'll, I'm gonna do is I'm gonna blow dry this and then see if I can then go and do a little bit of an, a, dish, a second color over top of it. Just to get, you know, we'll darken things and maybe even lighten a few things as well. Okay. So I'm just going to mute the audio for a moment. Okay. Oh, and a little brown right there. That's those are those little things that you gotta make sure you you miss because that would be kind of devastating to get all the way almost done the painting and then you get to a place where you're like, oh no, and then trying to match that color with the other area around it. This this would be a pain. Um. Okay. Let's do, should we do the dark or the lighter version on top of this? Um, it's also kind of like, this color might appear wildly inaccurate right now, but it's also because we got this big yellow shape right in the middle that is kind of confusing our eye. Like this color that we've got down here is close to kind of what I see underneath a few areas in here. So she's definitely lightened and then darkened over top of this. So I think I'd probably find it easier to maybe lighten a little bit and then darken a little bit. So to lighten, we want to take a little bit of white and let's just mix it right in here. I'm just going to take a bit of that yellow. Her daughter is just living her best life today. Had a fun Easter egg hunt. My wife went to Lots of trouble spent the last week putting it together. Oops, putting it together. A little bit of warm red on that. I don't think that's up too bad. Okay. So that is almost, that's a little bit lighter even. You know what? I'm just gonna go with it. I, I just again, you could see I didn't put much white in there at all. Uh, it's also a little deceptive because that matte medium uh, kind of appears white. I suspect this, as it dries, it's gonna get thinner and thinner. But it might be worth just putting a bit more matte medium in there, just to. The more medium I put in there, the thinner the color is. So even if there is solid white. It's not going to cover, it won't be nearly as opaque. Yeah, it's pretty opaque, Michael. I probably should have 
wiped my brush off after mixing these colors. But it is what it is. much more even color here ah, yeah that's not not my not super happy with this just yet but we'll see so I'm just gonna blend that out basically into a dry brush and let's also bring this a bit in here Now the next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to do a little bit of a gray gradient in here. So I'm going to take my black, mix this in here. Ugh, that was too much. Actually, you know what? I'm just going to get rid of that. I'm not happy. I do like that gray. I like how that turned out, but I just don't think it's going to work for this painting. So now we're just going to make a dark brown. We could even just use the, the black and just sort of glaze over top of this. Um... But I think I'm going to mix that dark brown again. Let me see. I'm feeling I got a lot of this blue before I cut that tube open. Oh, I still got... Let's use this first. So let's just mix this right here. Oh, what was I? I was going to make a brown. Here I'm starting to make my black. Let's see if I can do this over here. bad because we're going to make it a dark color anyway. I just want a bit more of a brownish color and then I'll take our black. And then I'm going to put a bunch of matte medium in here like that. So ideally this would be a little bit more on the reddish side, cool red side. Right now, that looks like a gray. It doesn't look, it's because that was the one I did earlier, which I wasn't happy with. I'm 
going to put just a bit more cool red in here. So see that little blob of cool red? And I'm just going to try to paint with a little bit of a drier brush. Oops, so now I feel like I should have blow dried. That's where that gray was. Hmm. Okay, so one of the reasons why I'm not getting the results I'm just, I really want in this area is because I remember I put that gray there and then I wiped it off. What that did is sort of just made this area slightly tacky. And then I tried to paint paint over top of it and it's sort of pulling paint off and sticking and it's not going on exactly the way I want. So I'm going to blow dry all of that and then I'm going to use some uh, glazing fluid to kind of connect the two there. So, I'm going to blow dry this. Okay, so I'm gonna get a couple things ready. I'm gonna have a, dr a totally dry brush here. You've probably seen me sometimes use a blending brush or what's called a mop brush for this. Um, that's that's after it's been used. It doesn't look like that when you buy it. Not quite nearly, in fact, just that's what a mop brush looks like when it's brand new. Um, let's take our glazing fluid.
you can just kind of fade that out. I'll come back to that. I'm just gonna have to take my paint and just go back into this area here. So one of the things, like if you were to have like a, uh, a, if you were an apprentice to an artist, like Vigée Lebrun, she also had a little school of, of students working under her at one point, um, when she was still quite young actually. And part of that, the role of those young people would be to do things like this, like do all of the backgrounds just get that gradient in and that would be like your that that's how you would learn like that you would literally be graded on things like that like how well of the the transitions between light and dark did you do was it effective or not and if it wasn't then you just wouldn't get you'd be like kind of demoted from that role lighter there okay so we're gonna blow dry this again and then it'll give us a little clearer idea as to how everything turned out and then we might do a little bit of finesse I'll do a little bit more finessing up here again I'm just gonna wipe that brush off because when I want this glazing fluid up here to make that transition I want to have relatively, I don't want so much pigment, especially pigment sneaking out of this brush. Okay, let's do this again. Ideally, trying to keep that brush relatively dry. So I'll put some more glazing fluid on here, right? Remember, this is my satin glazing fluid, right? So it's not, um, not glossy. So now I'm not really using the glazing fluid, I'm just dipping more and more into the... All right, so I was mixing it up in here, and then as I, I go, I just started using less and less. And I think I'm pretty happy with that. 
There's some areas here. I might try to... I could do a little bit of glazing in here to fix that, because that would give me really thin paint, but I could also just try to expand that a little bit when I paint, but that's, there's that, that is going to drive me nuts. I'm just talking about this little bit of darker blob right there. Um, I guess the other question, do I want to make this even darker down here? I think so. I'm going to blow dry that and then just let's just see how that transition up there turns. Holly asks a great question, Are do we use transparent mixing white or zinc white very often? And the answer is no. All, for every one of these paintings I've been using titanium white. I, I do, I was planning prior to the war in Ukraine, I was going to do an, a, like a sixth episode for our, our master study intro class on different whites and when to use them. Um, so that was going to happen last month. Things obviously took a bit of a detour, but it's on my schedule um, because I think it is something interesting. Basically, without going too far off the deep end, what you're talking about, which might be unfamiliar to most people, um, is So we have transparent mixing white, this is zinc white, and we have this is uh, vivid white. And essentially zinc white and transparent white are very similar. Zinc white is more commonly, you hear this more in oil paint, but, but they're basically the same. I'm, I'm pretty sure this transparent mixing white is also a zinc based pigment. Yeah, zinc, yeah, that's the main ingredient in here. Um, so this, and basically these paints have less tinting strength than your than your um, titanium white. Titanium white, you could see, I just put a little bit in here, and this went much wider and lighter than I was really hoping, right? So then I had to put more and more uh, matte medium to get it a little bit more transparent. These will sort of it's like if you just paint it on it, they, they just don't cover up so much they're they're, they're semi opaque semi transparent so you can't you I could have used something like this to to be a little bit more refined and these are definitely much more advanced things like I mean, we've done 214 paintings and plus with titanium white so you don't really it's that it's sort of like a very specialized tool the other thing just while i'm just talking about whites is really briefly is this vivid white which is like the exact opposite it's like super concentrated white so it's like super opaque and gives you brilliant like whiter than white colors right so and then so yeah in between that you've got your Right, these types of things where this being very, very white, white enough, and then sort of a little bit white, <laughs> I guess. Um, okay, <laughs> so do I want to do that darker? Does it matter? 
Let's just do a little bit here. Just okay. So I'm going to put a little bit more uh, glazing fluid down there, and I'm going to take some of my dark paint and just mix this into here. Do we, we could do, you know what, let's just, I, there, I could do a lot of things. We're basically going to use that same sort of technique, though, to come back around on her backside and to darken that. Hmm. Uh, this is wood, would these, uh, would those whites work for for lightning instead of the medium. Uh, I'm not... Uh, medium makes things more... just makes the color more transparent. It's like if you've got a soup and it's too salty, it's like adding more water in there to dilute that soup. Um, or maybe not even water. It's like adding chicken broth or vegetable broth it's like soup without any vegetables in it so if you think of like okay i'm just going off a tangent if you think of paint as like a um as like a stew or something where you've got the broth and then you've got chopped up vegetables and meat or something right the vegetables and meat are like your pigment the color and then the broth would be like your medium and the medium sort of ties it all together. Otherwise, you just got a bunch of vegetables and meat on a plate, right? To make a soup, you have that broth that kind of strings it all together and turns it into a soup. Um, and uh, if you felt it was too, I don't, I'm not sure if this, <laughs> if this analogy works. Um, yeah. Uh, you could continue to, if you want to thin that soup out, uh, you could add more and more broth, and it's and you're just not going to have as each. You could technically give. So let's say you had <laughs> uh, uh, five people over for dinner, but ten people show up, and you're like, oh no, I, I, but I'm out of vegetables. Well, we could stretch that soup out to feed all ten people by adding more broth. But just every time you know you ladle out that soup into ten bowls, there's going to be less vegetables in those bowls, right? Which is like if we add matte medium or glazing fluid to the paint, you're still having soup, but it's just um, you don't have as many vegetables. It's not as hearty of a soup, right? Um, I think yeah, that might be. So yeah, I don't I, yeah. I, it's a Saturday. <laughs> my day off. My brain isn't fully functioning. Okay, so I think that's good enough, right? It's a, it's a little bit inconsistent up here. I also don't mind that. I mean, if we look at the original, you could see I've definitely hers was a, got a little bit more green. I remember when I was putting my blue into my brown and being like, oh, it's uh, it's going a little bit. In fact, if anything, that would have been more desirable, right? Because now that I see this, this is much more of a greenish brown than here. I've got much more of a reddish brown. Um, but a little, you know, we can also see that hers is not like a perfect gradient. You can see there's areas where it's a little bit darker. It looks a little bit patchy. But ultimately, those are things that we might not depending on how well we execute this we may we might not even look at the background that's the ideal right i think often people fetishize these perfectly smooth gradients and that's something um that you could spend a lot of time doing right we could spend another couple of hours really doing this so it would be absolutely perfect but at the end of the day people would be like man you spent a long time on that background <laughs> okay uh, let's 
go to our next step. Okay. So now that we've got our background at least pretty well established, I, I'm hoping we don't feel a need to go back there afterwards. Let's now start working on the figure. And we maybe we should start right off the bat on the face, I think. Uh, just getting some color in here, just a very, what we would call our local color. And the local color is sort of the color that's in between, it's the middle value, right? And it's the color that's neither dark or, or sh in shadow, nor the color that is in the light or the highlights, right? And so it's it also looks you can see that there's she's I mean Vigil Lebrun was a master and you can even just see that there's a slightly different color to the the face in the mirror versus here right this face is a little bit lighter a little bit brighter um, a little bit more intense colors whereas the one in the mirror is slightly muted maybe even a bit more yellowish brown which I think is brilliant because again, especially mirrors at that time were much more primitive. And if you've ever seen like an older mirror, um, you know, they're, it's like a piece of glass with silver on the back. And sometimes they get like, they kind of blotch and they, they kind of fade in funny ways. Um, so I think it's really interesting that she was perceptive enough to notice that there's a difference between the the face as it is and then this mediated image through the mirror and how that that reflection loses some of the light that's 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 great that's <laughs> so i wonder i mean we could do a little bit of that with a glaze afterwards that's depending on, on if you want to try to i mean that we're talking a a tiny little detail but it's those details especially back in the day you have a bunch of artists that are you know experts in their field looking at this art which we see less and less today right the the audience for painting you know you have some painters go look at paintings but the vast majority of people know have never painted before and they're like yeah it looks great right um let's see so the anyway the my long I'm on tangents all day today. I want to go for something a little bit like of a peachy color, not this quite yellow, but a little bit peachier. So to do that, we are going to we don't need a tremendous amount of it. Uh, we're gonna make take. I would say mostly yellow. So you can think of like maybe 65% yellow, 25% red. In fact, that's maybe a little bit too much red. Let's just have a bit more yellow. That's pretty good. Kind of a very light orange. And then we're going to take like 5% blue, warm blue. So all warm, all three of these are warm colors. And you can see I barely, there's barely any blue in here. And then we get this very light brown. And some people may even just still think this is just like an orange, really. I mean, if you do this and it looks kind of orangey, that just tells you that you've got maybe too much blue and not enough red. If it goes kind of purpley, it means you've got a lot of red and blue and not enough yellow. Okay, I think that's pretty good. We may want to add a little bit more red here in a moment, but we'll see very shortly because we're going to put some white into this color. Start out with like a lot of white. And then let's look at. So, again, where I'm looking at is something in here. 
Let's add a bit more red. Okay. I'm happy with that. when they're around the same size. Okay. And then as I like to do, just sort of paint over this whole thing. I know that we've talked about, like, zones of the face a few times. Um, but this is, I just consider this sort of my, the, the, like an underpainting of the flesh values here. The the middle value, and then we can add maybe a bit more yellow on the forehead, a little bit more of a pink rose on the cheeks, and a bit bluer on the chin. We'll get in there in a mi minute. Also, because she's this the way that she's painted this, there's very little shadow on the face. Like it's very even. That's also kind of a little bit unusual. Ideally, I want to cover up these black lines along the edge. Now, I, it might seem like they everything's disappeared, but if I Kind of hold my hands over there. You can see that all of my the darker lines that I painted in earlier as part of my underpainting are still visible, at least to me. Maybe not quite so much on camera, but I, I, I all I really want is for it to be very subtle anyway. You know, maybe it doesn't make for the easiest thing to see on camera, but that's kind of the point. Is you you're you we're just sort of covering up a bunch of things and then as long as you can see your underpainting in there then that's all that matters It will also, as this dries, get a little bit lighter. Okay, so I just want to make sure... Oh, see, I was going to say, got to make sure that I've got everything. You know what? Here's this thumb right here. And the other thing I just look for, is there any place like in the hair where sometimes you have underneath the bangs a lot of the skin of the forehead showing through, so I'm just going to do that. And then I can cover the hair over top. Okay, so that looks good. Again, I just want to make sure there's not like a 
a foot or a knee or something hanging out here that like I forget to paint. Sometimes I, I do that and then you're like, ah, oh, now how am I going to match that foot color to the rest of the body? And then you got to mix, you know, a very similar skin tone. It can be really tricky. <laughs> I like your comparison there, Pascal, between eau de toilette and eau de perfume. One is more concentrated. If you add more medium, it becomes less concentrated. It's still perfume, but less intense, less opaque. Interesting. I did not know. I don't know anything about the difference between eau de toilette and eau de perfume. So I'm learning some today, too. Okay. Let's see, what do we want to do next? Let's take a look. Let's do the, let's do her hair, I guess, right now. In fact, we could just use, remember we made this brown, or it looks a little bit kind of an orangey brown before. I think we can use, that color actually is not too far off her hair color. Obviously it's darker, but this thing is gonna look nice if we paint that now. And then we can paint some darker stuff over top of it. Cause she's got a little bit of this, um, maybe that's a, that is a little bit, Lighter. Well, actually, you know what? That's fine. Yeah, I think this will be perfect. So basically, this is just my skin tone without any white in it at all. I'd left a little bit of that forehead I painted with <coughs> her skin tone and then I just covered it right up so oh well okay let's go to here this kind of gray up there interesting that would have remember that gray I put right above her head and I wiped it away that would have been probably perfect right here now that I see that that's okay we'll mix that separately it looks like it's mostly dried on my palette but goes to show that there's always you know, sometimes you, 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 you make a color and it's not the right color. Sometimes it's not the right color for that part of the painting, but it's not the wrong color entirely. It's just, it could be used elsewhere. Okay. Pasco says, oh, are there many versions of this paint? I think there's, 
when I was watching one of the documentaries on her, I did see a slightly different version of this with a white frame with red markings on it rather than this red frame. So it's possible, you know, what happens all the time with artists is you make a painting and then um, uh, people like it and they're like, oh, can you make me one of those? And that actually happened quite a lot with this specific artist where she uh, well, uh, made this self-portrait of herself with um, a, uh, what they call the straw hat, although it wasn't, it was felt, but it became her calling card and lots of women were like, I want you to paint me just like that with that same hat. So let's do the, let's do the green next. And you can see there's a few different greens in here. We've got, this is a cool green. And then we've got warm green. Right, these are warm greens and cool greens. So um, we'll start off with our cool green and I think probably do most of her dress in a cool green. And then we'll do some of the highlights in a warmer green. So mm, let's go to slip bigger brush again. Do I dare? Let's see. We can get away with. Actually, that's not bad. I thought there was going to be more pigment mixed in there. Oops. So I'm just taking my uh, cool yellow and mixing cool blue into it. We, we want. Actually, if, kind of a teal almost. So much more of like a blue green. And we take a bit of white and mix this in here. That's not bad. I think I'm going to take a bit of my darker color though and just put in put that in. Turn this into a bit more of a slightly gray. So I'm just going to paint with this. Although you know what? I'm also just going to add a little bit of matte medium in here. Now that looks like I just added white to it, but it's just it's gonna dry clear. It's just gonna make this a little bit thinner. Okay. Maybe we'll, again, we'll st I like to kind of start maybe at the bottom. And you're like, whoa, that's wrong. Well, it's really bright, and this is gonna be under shadow at some point. Hmm. 
And then mostly up here we've got You know, we could just paint the whole thing with this green as well, by the way. <clears throat> so make sure I don't have any green. You know, there's that little bit there. There's no green hiding elsewhere. I think that's good, right? Next, I'm just going to take a bit of more white and mix this right up here. I think I need a bit more blue in there, too. There we go. And get some of the brighter highlights. just take a second here since we were just talking about other versions of this painting yeah so here okay so this version oops won't let me zoom in that's as close as it's gonna let me go this is at the Metropolitan Museum in New York and you can see the difference here with this different colored frame also not quite as dark this one looks like it's maybe more refined in some ways mine the one that we're painting has got a little bit more of a slightly more brushy quality interesting so I, I think I might prefer this one especially also for our use too it's just a little bit less refined so a little bit more manageable for us the let's do the 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 other green, a little bit light, uh, the warmer green. So we're going to take some warm blue. Let's do this right down here. With mostly cool, warm, warm, warm yellow. And a little bit of, of uh, warm blue. For this, I'm just going to use a smaller brush. And this is kind of, I'm not, this is interesting for using, so I need even more yellow. This is definitely predominantly warmer yellow.
I'm just gonna mix some of the cool blue into my warm yellow as well. So I got kind of in between these two. So this is not not the the last time I'll touch this area. Only well, maybe depending on how long other places take. But just sort of just getting this kind of approximated approximated is kind of a big step just to kind of get that started down there. Because right, obviously this is gonna get much darker. Holly's signing off for the day. Um, I'm a little bit behind. My pain has to dry for a while. Looking forward to seeing your results. Have a great night, Holly. Pascal says, could her students have painted one of the copies? It's, that's very likely. It's very likely that she had someone making copies for her. That was um, definitely something an artist would do is if you've got one painting that people like hey then you it's like you're you've got a the proven concept and you're gonna make more of them let's go to her, the, we'll do the white now. So this white is, uh, I think we want something that's maybe just, we can take even really any of our colors here and just add white to it. Maybe like a, a, a white with a little bit of brown. I think we probably want something a little bit more, uh, kind of a little bit creamier. So maybe a little bit more yellow in it. So let's take some white and where should we do this? Do it down here. I'm gonna take a bit of, oops, that's a lot. That's a lot. Uh, I'm just gonna wipe my brush off. That's okay too, if it's a little bit, because then we can just use a actual white as a highlight. I'm gonna take just, uh, that's not bad, I just want a little bit of brown. And I'm also just gonna dump a bit of glazing fluid in there just to thin it out a little bit more. That just remember again, if we're painting white, titanium white, on top of anything, it's gonna we're gonna lose all those details. So by adding some matte medium, it's gonna make it a little bit more transparent, so that we can see what's underneath all of that.
bright so I can still see some of my pencil lines under here. Don't worry about the fact that this is darker gray. That's all. We'll tackle that eventually. So often if you see me kind of using my thumb like that just to smudge things away, sometimes it's because I want, uh, the it's in the wrong place, but sometimes it's more, usually it's because there's some texture I've built, I got a little ridge of paint, and that ridge of paint takes longer to dry, and not only that, but it can leave texture there that they can be a little bit difficult to to overcome or paint over and you know if it if it echoes the the shape of you know let's say if there was one a big piece of texture going right across here that would be fine because you know we have this um, kind of shawl or whatever over her head but if it was going in a completely different direction then it just sort of it, it interrupts the flow of the painting and is just not flattering, so. I did just add a little bit more actual white here because of all of that that those brush strokes that came over top of her head here. I want to try to cover that up a little bit. thing behind her head remember I was saying that's kind of drives me crazy it's less apparent it's still there but uh, mm, we'll see I can always maybe do a little bit of glaze in that area but I think it's gonna be fine I mean I could have a big blop kind of come out here I mean, I'm so tempted just to paint that shape out. Oh, I do just want to... Yeah. To me, that's all I th think I need to do, and it doesn't seem to be 
too bad. Okay. <laughs> now, though, obviously, there's little things here, but we'll do that at another time. We'll get to that. Let's. Uh, we got a little bit more. Oh, I see part of. I think that's good enough. Okay. Like I would say we're about halfway done. I'm feeling pretty good about, about where we are at at this particular stage. Because now we've got everything established. I mean, I guess we just need to do the frame and the background in within the frame. So maybe let's do the background within the frame right now. Remember, this is the color that I put down over top here. So I'm gonna use that same color. In fact, I'm gonna paint two quick layers in here. Lots of people on the watching, hopefully painting, a lot, very quiet chat all of a sudden. That's good. It usually is a sign that people are painting, like for Thanksgiving dinner when it's, the table goes quiet. That usually means people are enjoying it or somebody just said something really offensive. <laughs> so hopefully I haven't said anything offensive. Okay. Let's now, I'm just wanna, so this, I just put a little bit, cause I wanna kind of put another color over top of it. And while I could just go right to that gray, we have a background that we worked to kind of build up a few little layers to. So let's do this, we just wanna do 
a little bit of that same sort of approach, right? We'll take a little bit of our white and a little bit of our black, mix them together, we get a gray. Let's make it just a little bit more of that. All right, and then we'll just take this color, mix that in here. So we get a bit of a gray. And just lastly, a little bit of glazing fluid on top. Let's do the frame next. Uh, let's mix. Obviously, this is a warm red. I guess maybe we could go mostly warm red, but I think we probably want to go a little bit more muted. So, if we just take warm red and just take a bit of cool blue from across the aisle over here, and mix that together, we're going to get a, just a slightly less intense red. I mean, we could just paint it just red right out of the tube. Um, but uh, I think we'd want something just, uh, well, you know, now I'm looking at, I, I think I, we could still add that bright red afterwards, but this looks more like the color that is over top of it now that I paint with it, but. Does look like I'm gonna need to put a little bit of white in here after all.
Okay, so because that's still a little bit transparent, I'm going to take a bit of white. Mix this in here. So I'm just using this white just to kind of block out the darker color that was kind of intruding on the frame. Okay. <laughs> Pascal just finished one painting, he's working on a second one. That's impressive. Okay. So. You know, this is this is definitely probably the you know now that we've got the whole canvas covered with paint, this is sometimes you know would be a good time if you wanted to take a break for the day and come back and finish it tomorrow or next week or maybe you've, you know you could certainly split the painting up into many different days and as an artist like uh, she would, just because you're painting with oils. There's parts in here where we would have had, this would have, even just to get to this place in an oil painting could take a couple of weeks. Depending, especially with the materials that, that she would have had access to in back in the day. It was, a lot of it was, you're making your own pigments, grinding up your own, your paints yourself. So, I think, uh, let's move to okay so I think I'm gonna move to my my next pass on the on the foreground because we've got everything basically locked in now we just need to start adding refining things we, we've got all of the colors in place we just now need some light and darks some highlights and shadows and that's just going to 
you know, be more refinements. And we could do a lot of that with just one color glaze, like a darker glaze, and then a, maybe a little bit of a lighter glaze. Uh, we're probably going to modify that a little bit more than that, though, but it's, we're probably we're much further ahead than you might suspect. It just takes a little bit of time to to do these next steps, but Okay, so, um, what I usually like to do is, is even still think about what's going to layer on top of what. So if I'm looking at this painting, like what is on, ultimately going to be on top of what, um, probably the, the thing that's, the, the, is on top of everything is this white fabric. So in in many ways that might be one of the last things you want to do I'm just gonna take my white though and just block out a little bit more of the background color that came over top that so prob so the the other way it was like what is the the furthest thing the thing that's underneath everything well that's probably the the skin right her skin is underneath her hair which is underneath this the the shawl her skin is underneath her clothes right um so I think it makes sense to maybe if I was to think of the order I'd probably do her her face both of her faces I guess her face hair her face hand hair the whites or what's it face ha face hand hair green white frame <laughs> sounds like a face face hand hair white face hand hair green white frame face hand hair white green frame face hand hair white green frame um so with this face what we want to do next is move into um, some of the darker values and, and really pull out the shapes that are in this face. That's a little too close. Okay. So remember we mixed a skin tone earlier. I think we're gonna we can still use uh, we gotta make it again. So I'm gonna take some warm red, warm yellow, mostly warm yellow is again. Remember basically underneath here is the color we used to to make the skin tone plus the hair, that first little bit of hair anyway. And then some warm blue. So that's kind of a nice darker color. Now it's obviously much darker than that. Um, so I'm going to take a bit of white and just mix this on top, right? So that's our skin tone. Um, let's take a bit more yellow So I'm kind of just darkening. In fact, I should probably paint her. Well, it's gonna 
We'll do her eyebrows and such here in a little bit. It's a bit dark. I wonder if I should be doing this as a glaze, glazing all of this. Yeah, you know what? Okay. Let's just wipe this away. Okay, so I'm just going to blow dry that. Okay. So I'm going to use glazing fluid here. That way I can blend this in a little bit smoother. It stays dry for a little bit longer. Just gives me maybe a little bit more. Flexibility here. All right, and then we can just take a dry brush Same thing over here. So I'm just looking for like, what are the darkest shapes and building up to those places? So like on, on her cheeks, under her nose, under her lips. First little step done. Uh, let's quickly blow dry that. Now 
Now let's go. Sorry, let will look at this here together. What I want to do, probably get a little bit more of a rosy cheeks here. So let's just take a bit more of warm red. All right. And again, a little bit of glazing fluid. Under her nose there. Do the same thing over here. So it's slowly appearing here. It looks a little bit, I'm not sure how that looks on, on your screen. It looks like maybe a little bit orangey to me on the screen, but in person it's looking okay. Um, a little bit heavy. Not. I didn't quite blend things out maybe as much as I would, as I'd like to do, but... Oh, you know, I keep, ah, I didn't do any of the hand here. So let me just, let's uh, just take a moment before I go any further. I want to do, take some of this, in fact, I'm going to go back to my the previous color that I did. And let's see, anywhere else, any, okay. So this thumb is kind of in darkness, right? That thumb is in darkness. It's gonna get darker, but it's kind of got a bit more of an orangey quality, right? Okay, so I'll blow dry that. I'm going to add the red onto this hand that I missed. this much more kind of reddish flesh tone here. I'm just going to go back over these lips. more of 
this red those fingers here a bit. So just that little bit of kind of slightly red underneath the eyebrows too. There's a bit of, we're gonna put a little bit of blue in here, but that just again gives it lots of life. Deborah's saying hello. Deborah's joining us. It's good. More and more people in watching and painting. It's interesting. Now you see things start to appear. Now that I've got more of the face done, I can see a little bit of the background is a little clumsy. We can do that towards the end and just kind of very lightly glaze back in here. But let's get the more of the face finished before we start doing that. Um, I should also say, like, one of the things that she is famous for, Vigée Lebrun, is, like, her the delicacy of the shadows and reflected light. That That's... might be her sort of signature ability. So much so that, um, in fact... Which painting is it? Her self-portrait. Let's see how quickly I can find it here. Hmm. That's weird. Where's her big, her famous self-portrait? Sorry, I'm looking here on... So, this painting right here is is wow look how close we can zoom in on this um this is like this is a self-portrait that she did and this was like her calling her. like what a beautiful painting isn't that just incredible oh my goodness but you could but she's famous for this delicate shadow on the face that you know Prior artists like Rembrandt, like remember we did the self-portrait of Rembrandt where the face was just bathed in that dark chiaroscuro, right? Very theatrical lighting. Here, and and that was, you know, that was how artists, you know, very. You know, it's, it, it's hard to not think of this as kind of very masculine versus more feminine, delicate touch, and using all these kind of uh, gender stereotypes, but. You know, you got to say, like, the way that she painted these faces and the shadows, especially on these, on the women, is just so soft and flattering versus maybe the more heavy-handed approach by men who would just sort of maybe have that really dark, heavy shadow, um, which might be more flattering on a male figure or male portrait, but on a female face, you you know, again, you tend to want to go a little bit softer. Um, it just seems to be a little bit more flattering. But that, that, man, just looking at that makes me like, man, that would be a fun painting to do just like that. I mean, the way that she did the hair, man, 
That just blows my mind. Man. <laughs> okay. Uh, sometimes you see things like that and you're like, why am I even doing this? It's like tilting at windmills. All right. Anyway. Where was I? I was doing the... Ooh, I just did a layer of red here. Very soft. Okay, so let's do a little bit of blue. Like a blue added to this here. So, um, it's, remember I can take this blue and we, if we mix it into our brown, we get a, a pretty dark brown. All right, so if we now take a little bit of this and bring it out in here, I don't know how well that shows up. Now we're getting a This is the type of color we want on faces, especially in the lower half underneath. I don't know how that well that's coming up on screen. Um, but it, it definitely has like a, almost like a slightly grayish blue quality in a brown. I, right? Very subtle, but that's a really nice uh, color to use for like the lower half or lower third of the face here. And so I'm just adding more glazing fluid to it because you want to do this pretty subtly. I mean, we can be very bold uh, to try to get the painting done as quickly as possible, but after you've invested a couple of hours into it, you're like, you might as well try to do this well, right? So we want a bit of this darker color. In fact, let's just check and see how dark it actually is. Not too bad. We could go even darker for sure. We will. But again, I always I look for like okay, let's do it underneath the chin. That's going to be a dark place. Underneath the lip, that's going to be a dark place. just have to be careful because right this is a portrait of a young girl so we don't want it to be too dark under there
Okay, let's just do a bit of this. That's what happens when you paint too much with a glaze and then you try to blend it away and it just wipes off a bunch of paint that you didn't want to, to be wiped off. So this is, tells me i got to blow dry even up there that's happening. So It's also interesting, you know, being a mother herself, she and and not being allowed to to paint many of the same subjects as men. One of the things that that often we see in a lot of women artists of this time is they they do they paint their families. And um and painting children which was very uncommon for male artists to do. We've, we see very few paintings, as, well, especially of their own family. They might be, men have been asked to paint the son or daughter of the king, but very few men actually painted their own children, you know, up until, like, maybe the Impressionists. I'm trying to, th I can't think of any male artist before that. Um, but it also coincide. I mean, who knows who did what or what effect it had, but it, it does coincide with a, a very a change in the way that children, the relationship between parents and their children and, the, and society and children. Because for... A long time children weren't even considered human beings like they they, they were sort of um, depending and especially depending on class like some sometimes young kids especially if you were in a lower class were just considered like farm animals and you you would have them working in factories and doing sometimes the most dangerous work which is hard for us to even understand today because ah, they're just little kids, you know, just grow another one, right? They're just come. There's lots of these little things running around, so we'll send it underneath the machinery to get the screws that fell out. And oh, well, let's get another one. Throw another one under there. Um, but even like, like we said, just like Vijay Lebrun, when she was a child, she was sent away to be raised by a wet nurse for like six years, until like she was, I think like eight years old and then she came back home maybe it was 10 so so it's interesting that you have this more and more women are being trained to paint and because of their constraints they're painting more and more images of their children and almost at the same sort of time society's view on children is also changing quite radically i don't know if there's a connection there but it is interesting to, to think about Okay, I think we can outline her facial features now. So let's take. She'll do, do. So 
going to take my darkest color and we'll put it oops so i just took my darkest color remember this is my warm red cool blue cool yellow mixed together to get a black i'm just going to bring that color down here into where i was painting my flesh tones and i don't want to just paint black all by itself right on the face that that's going to look really weird so at the very least i want to in integrate it with some of my other flesh tones so that it kind of it it blends into what's around it um so i probably should have done a, a brown here for the eyebrows but so i'm going to start by just painting her top eyelids and maybe you know what before I go any further I should probably also paint the white of her eyes. So let's paint the white of her eyes. So I'm just going to take some white. There's a lot of other colors in here. So I'm just taking a white, but it's, I mean, you can see I actually didn't even wash my brush because I don't want a pure white. Otherwise, it's going to look really weird because these eyes aren't pure white. Just spinning that brush to get it a little bit cleaner. already that was like oh it might be a little bit too too white but and I also just paint a little bit in over top of the iris so that there's a little bit of I can paint back over top of it Okay. So let's, uh, I'm going to go back into my dark color again. I like how there's just a light gray. And you know what? Maybe even before I do that, let's get this, the eye color. It's a little bit of a bit of a blue let's take some 
uh, warm blue and white. Okay, well, that's just uh, baking here. I'm going to work on her fingers. Doing a little bit of outlining, which I'm sure if she was my teacher, she would slap my hand for doing. But since I'd like to wrap up in about an hour and a half or so, I'm doing a bit of that which an artist should not do, but I do anyway <laughs> all the time. Sort of delicately glazing underneath that top lip there. We'll, we'll, we're going to darken a few little bits here and there. I'm going to take my my actual dark color, my black, and just come back in, and I'm going to put it back in here with a little bit of glazing fluid and paint more directly with a darker color.
you'd kind of it's like brain surgery when you're painting such tiny little Okay, next, oh yeah, let's, I want, I want to take a bit of a brown. All right, so here we, we got our brown, let's get it darker. Right, so this is just my warm red, warm yellow, and warm brown, more, warm blue, sorry, to make a warm brown. It's not quite as dark as my black. Here's some glazing fluid. Just a bit more yellow in it, just to lighten it up a bit. A very sim we can actually just use this exact color I just made for hair as well. So maybe I was going to just use this for eyebrows, but we'll do it for her hair as well. So that's the the like reflected light coming up underneath her chin there.
and then I want to bring that same sort of attention to the uh, her other face. Paul says, I just, I'm running late. I just got home from picking my daughter up from the hospital. She got discharged today. Thanks for the bonus class. I'll catch up. I mean, I must have missed uh, uh, the, the, the story about your daughter being in the hospital, Paula. I think I, there was something earlier, I, I guess I just, a few days ago. So I, I, I'm sorry I missed that. I, I hope your daughter's doing well. It's, that's uh, scary your daughter being in the hospital knock on wood uh, Greg says I've got to know what music channel you play it's very relaxing background music the music is done by a friend of mine named Sam Davidson or aka skim milk <laughs> and uh, one, one of my closest friends he was one of the best men at my wedding and um, I've gone on tour with him we've we did things where we were doing performances at uh, uh, high schools in the lower mainland and um, a, I think a genius absolutely he sometimes pops in and says hello here um, I think there might be a link to his website on the he's doing um, a little bit more soundtrack stuff lately but uh, I'm uh, it is the same thing over and over and over again. I've asked him to write some more stuff, but he's a pretty busy guy, so... Um, what should we do next? I want to speed up a little bit. I, obviously, I want to do more hair, but I think I just want a little bit of a breather from that. So let's do the green. Let's do the green here and see how much of that we can get done in... There we go. Uh, 
So for this green, I uh, need a bit more warm, cool yellow, I mean. yellow and cool blue together. And we're going to also darken it. So we'll just go right to our darker color here. need to put so much glazing fluid in there. Okay. So, just gonna wipe some of that off. Let's larger brush. Or sorry, smaller brush. I mean. What's going on there? I know, but what were you just doing? Oh, she finally went back to nap. Did she actually go to nap? Oh, I thought, okay. Sorry, just chatting with, with my wife there, Amy. Yeah, I'll leave that. It's a little bit lighter. Obviously, but uh, we'll just leave that for now.
so now I'm going to take, actually I can probably do this with here, I'm going to just dive right into this, i got more glazing fluid, which makes it much thinner. It's just going to make it too much, too wet of a brush here. I'm going to move up onto her arm here now. I'll leave just this little sliver of reflected light here. here now. Uh, Donna says um, Paula had a daughter had a ruptured appendix. 
Oh my goodness. I had some pulses. Ooh. Just had to st uh, stay a week in a hospital. Oh, I, uh, I remember staying a week in the hospital. Overweighted before going to hospital. It was bad. Yikes. Hope she recovers quickly. Yes, I agree, Pascal. Good. Much improved. That's... Oof. I would lose my mind if anything happened to her daughter. Holy smokes. Um, so that's, do I want to do, let's, let's try to finish up the, the, the clothes now. I'm like, yeah, should we do it? We'll come back to that. Let's do it now. Having said that, I was just gonna say, let's finish the green. It would be a lot easier to to do the, the white fabric and then to do like a darker glaze over top of everything. I don't, then I don't have to be, it'll, it'll be faster, it'll be faster. So I'm gonna, just gonna continue on here. Let's do the, let's do her fabric. So that's a, a gray. I think if we just look here, yeah. Basically, we can use that same gray and we can come down into here too. So, um, here's our dark color. I'm just going to put a bit of white into it and again, make it a gray, not just black. You can see now it's gone a bit purple. Which is not bad, but I'm going to put a bit of cool yellow into it. That's going to keep it more in the the gray side than the purpley side. See how adding that yellow helped? It looked a little bit too purpley. And sometimes I find when I'm making my grays, they tend to be a little bit purpley because I just forget to put the cool yellow into it. But that makes a big difference, right? Now let's add glazing fluid here because we want something pretty subtle okay just trying to think is there anywhere I want to put this maybe I can actually I was going to wipe it off but I think there's a few areas in here that, that need to be pretty gray P pretty gray so I'm actually expanding that, which is, I think I needed to do, but it also helps because there was a little bit of a area in behind there that just didn't seem to be too clean. Let's take my other brush and see if I can soften these edges a bit too late. I 
because I'm not super pumped with, with all of what I just did, but... So obviously the, so not done, I'm just laying in like folds and such, and then I'm gonna glaze over top of all of these and give more nuance to them.
just motoring right along here. So, so for instance, here's a little ridge that just got built up. That's one I don't mind because it sort of reflects the curving of like the fabric. So I'm, I, I like that there. That's, that's a good curve or good texture because it emphasizes the form. her the reflection in here Thank you. 
add a little bit of fabric to this here. And then importantly, also, I want to have that little curve, which makes it appear like her, this is going up and around, All right? And that's really, really important. You can see, obviously, she did that. We want to make sure we include that as well. Maybe just while I got some of this little bit, this color on here, I'll just brush it around. Uh, zoom out and just take a quick stock of where we're at. Okay. So uh, we're going to do another layer of glaze over top and just keep on darkening. And Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with the way things are where, where we're at.
wish I had done her that a little bit more cream colored. Now it looks so much whiter, right? <laughs> and those are those hard to see when you're painting, you know, that uh, those distinctions earlier on. Okay, so I'm going to take some of my red. I'm going to make this a little bit of a slightly orange. That's a little loud. So it wouldn't have surprised me if she put these patterns in in a fairly late stage. This little bit of kind of orangey red that I'm painting right now. Because she might have felt like this looked a little flat, all this fabric. And as soon as you put a, a pattern on fabric, you can really give it some dimension. Because we can really feel how it wraps around things. and. So, very, you know, really smart idea on her part. Um, okay. Getting there, getting there. I mean, I, I probably, I could be pretty happy with just walking away right now. But I want to darken her hair, darken these clothes, do the frame, and then I think we'll be done. So, maybe even... Oh, okay, that's gonna take a second to reboot. One second. I guess it's tea time. Okay. So, I've I'm getting very close to being finished here. What I want to do is a little bit of glazing to darken the darks. Maybe a little bit of highlights, the frame, darken her hair. And so we're, we're getting pretty close. We, you know, I don't want to I always say like, we'll be done in 10 minutes. And then two hours later, we're still painting. But I'm thinking maybe half hour, ideally, from, from now is when we'll be all wrapped up. Or wrapping up. So, uh, what should we do first? Let's do the frame. We haven't done the frame in a little while, so let's tackle that, get that sorted out. So, 
So the frame is a kind of a, a darker brown. Well, actually, you know, what? let's paint the whole thing. I'm just gonna take this warm red. Actually, I'm gonna give it a little bit of dark. I don't want it to be per totally popping. It's actually even got a bit of orange in it too. So. It's gonna paint over the whole thing. There's a little bit of that the the kind of pink that I put underneath here just to kind of block out some of the the is that gonna drive me nuts? Yeah, let's scrape that right. Ooh. But I don't, actually don't mind that little bit, that halo effect of that pink coming through. Like right here, I might even just leave that there. Deliberately keep a bit of that there because that's where the light is catching it do a little bit of a darker um, red now. So we'll take this red. Let's do take just a little bit of cool blue from the opposite side here. Let's just make a bit more of it. Then we get our pretty dark color so let's just put a bit of red back in here. Put a bit of glazing fluid off to the side. I'm gonna wanna blow dry this just real quickly before I paint on it, that way I can blend. It's interesting looking at that you can see you can see it's like a child's frame like it looks like it's been drawn and painted on that's also a nice little touch you know I didn't notice that really at first okay so now we're just gonna darken this kind of area inside here
Indeed, I might have to come back and add a little bit of brighter red back there. I don't know why, how I was unable to preserve a bit of that, but it is what it is. try that. Let's just give a little bit of some funky little marks or something in here. So let's darken. You know, I'm seeing these little lines, I, which is something I did not, certainly did not see the first time, brings me a lot of joy because it just makes me think of like little kids and how they, <laughs> they destroy everything around them and things get painted on and colored and, you know, it's just, there's something kind of really, again, I gotta say, this seems to me kind of like the thing that a mother would do rather than a father, especially at this time, right? 
men would have been pretty you know absent in their children's lives at this time and for her to like make these little marks on that shows like her how she's observing her child but also just like a, it's something that you know kind of in some way runs counterintuitive like you'd think like you might want to make it a really nice clean beautiful frame and here she's choosing to to sort of show the child holding this frame that she's clearly drawn over and scratched on and all that kind of stuff um which i just think is would have been a very different impulse if like her contemporary jacques louis david had done this i think he would have made a very different painting and he's, he certainly would not have have sort of put little scratches and things on the on the frame to make it appear kind of more personal okay maybe just while I got this darker color here I like this painting. This is nice. I like this. This is brings me some some good smiles. So, um, I want to do mix. I'm, I need more brown and darker brown for the hair. So let's take um, warm yellow, warm red. Still want the majority to be uh, warm yellow, but we're gonna take some uh, of our. Oops, it's not on camera. I thought that was gonna be on camera. Sorry. That was my warm yellow, warm red, and then warm blue. I think I'm just going to make a bit more of it here. So that's probably about as... We, we might go one step darker than that, but this is going to be probably plenty dark for enough for at least this moment. I'm just going to put a bit of glazing fluid on it to make this paint go a little bit, um, make it just a little bit more, uh, not less, well it's going to, it's, it will make it a little more transparent, but really what I want is just the paint to be a little bit more fluid. That's the, so. Uh, and I don't mind it being a little bit more transparent because um, we want to preserve some of these colors underneath. Okay, in fact, I'm just going to blow dry everything because I just want to make sure I don't stamp my hand on it. I 
think I'm gonna have to go darker after all. I thought this this looked see it's part partly because I added a, a lot of uh, of uh, was it matte medium or glazing foot? I think it was matte medium I put in this. <laughs> um, So that's that's good we're gonna do one more that's gonna just go into some of the darker pockets of hair in a little bit here So this is pretty tricky to do with with a you know the scale that we're talking here. These are the size of my fingernails. All this hair. Um, we we're painting on a larger surface, and we had time to spare. I'm sure we could do a much better job. So we're just kind of fudging it a little bit.
So let's blow dry that. Then we're going to go uh, to our darkest. So now let's just take our dark color again. Remember, we mixed that like four hours ago. It's still wet, right? People always talk about acrylics drying too quickly. You know, my studio is a little bit cool. Um, and we are in Vancouver, so it's a humid climate. But, you know, you could still, you know, especially if there's, if you're, if you're, there's not a lot of paint on your palette. Um, then it's obviously going to dry very quickly. Um, okay, so let's start over here. Oops, I need to get. Been wanting to add a bit more hair up here. I guess it should be a little bit more orangey, right? Thank you. 
Hmm. It didn't turn out as expected. Okay, so because I added a bit of that color, which doesn't quite match anything else here, elsewhere in this, in her hair, I then, in order to make it work, I've got to go and sort of put a bit of that color elsewhere. So that it doesn't just seem like really way out of place there. Uh, Heidi's just joined us, went for a big long walk around Stanley Park and wants to know about the Posca pens we use. So this is the 0 .07 millimeters. The PC... My eyes, what is that? PCJM? 
PCJMB or R. I don't know what that last letter is. It looks like an R. PC. Maybe that's a one. PC1MR. The pin type 0 0.7 millimeters, which is I think the smallest one they make. And I like that one because I can always widen my lines, but if you got a thicker one, it's harder to do thinner lines, right? Okay, I think I'm just going to leave that hair alone. It's not exactly the way I want it, but, you know, what else? What is exactly the way I want it in life? <laughs> I don't know. There's a lot of things I wish would be exactly the way I want it. I, mean, I always think of painting as one of those things that 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 is always a reminder to, like, let go. And just, be, you know what? It's just... Just going to do what it wants to do today, so you just, you can get frustrated or you can just accept it. And it's, I, in the scheme of things, probably I'm the only person that will ever notice any difference. <laughs> so let's now, I want to just do a little bit of final glazing to, to wrap things up. Just, I want to darken her, her body. So let's just take a look at these side by side just so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, like we could we could really I mean one might say that that we could probably darken things down like 50% or more. Um, so let's we'll just play it by ear. Let's take a bit of our darkest color gonna put it down here I'm gonna put my glazing fluid in I'm gonna start with just the color that's you know a little bit that's on my brush and then we can just we can go all over the place but let's start
pump hit there. even going to do a little bit in her hair. And then we're just gonna keep on going over top of things and darkening and darkening. Like that, I don't know how visible that, that appeared to, to you, but it definitely did pull things down maybe 10% darker. I, we still need to go further, but I'm as I do this, I do maybe less and less, right? So if you know the if it goes from like white to black here, that first pass is just this area, and then this area and I go and I don't even have to darken it I just do subsequent layers and those the darker areas just get darker and darker and darker and darker remember to blow dry it though before you do too much Maybe just for the sake of speed here, I am going to get a little... I'm going to go much darker, actually. I just don't have time to do many, many, many layers. So... You can see much darker down here. Use a soft brush just to kind of smooth things in.
<laughs> I hear our daughter causing chaos upstairs while my poor wife is on her own trying to make some dinner. And that's usually a good sign that I better get my butt up there. I mean, we're getting there, like, and then you start, to, okay, let's... Ay, ay, ay. Blow dry that. I mean, I could just, I can keep on going, darkening and darkening. I don't think you can go too far. Because the more depth you have, the deeper these shadows get, the, the more depth your painting's gonna have. And, and usually that's very desirable. Now the one little thing here 
that I want to do is just come right in between her lips in the in the frame. So I'm going to blow dry this because I want to do a little bit of glazing right there. You guys talking about Posca pens? There is a you can buy the full 72 set of or no full 29 set of Posca pens for 72 dollars Canadian, I think. Um, which sounds expensive as an as a you know as a purchase, but if you're gonna use Posca pens, you know each one comes to like five six dollars individually. So if you buy you know, 29 times 5 is certainly way more than $72. So just something to think about if you if you're um, if you're buying a lot of them. But obviously, just like anything else, you buy in bulk, you're gonna get a much better deal. Okay, so this is my color for the background. I'm gonna glaze with this. Just to clean up, that makes a huge difference. blow dry that real quick. Thank you. 
Okay, so there was some mistakes there that I was trying to fix by mixing a glaze and I, I didn't quite do it properly. So now I feel a little bit of a need to kind of touch this up, which is always a bit of a danger thing, right? When you're getting close to finishing. Um, so I, just to try to unify everything, let's see if I can do a quick glaze in this neighborhood. Uh, Okay, I think I was able to kind of pull that, fix a little bit of that there. I'm happy with that. I do, now that I, I kind of glazed a little bit over some of my darker areas. So I just want to come back and add a little bit of it, go back with some my darker color.
Okay, I think I can walk away from that. Although it's interesting, sometimes people called her by her middle name there. Somebody making a fuss. Lots of fusses every few minutes today. Let's watch out Apple. there. Where does that sand oh, down there? The um. Okay. <laughs> so let's. Oops, I'm all discombobulated here. <laughs> um. Okay, so it's that time. We're going to wrap up. Let's just do a quick side-by-side -side comparison and see how they turned out. Um, if you enjoyed what you've seen, please like, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I strongly encourage you to take a moment to take a photograph of your artwork, upload it to the Facebook group so that we can all share in it, and so that we can see the finished result. Um, we also once a month go through all of the artwork that's on the Facebook group and do a feedback episode where we take I give some feedback on how we might be able to improve that work. So let's just take a quick second to look at them side by side. Now I think that's a little, little bit. <laughs> so maybe a little bit closer idea as to what it would look like. Um, obviously the colors are a little bit brighter. I've got a little bit more uh, intensity in my greens down here. I don't mind that. As I said, I also didn't get the the background quite. I've got a, a darker, a, a more reddish brown, whereas she has a, a more greenish brown, which makes a lot of sense. It, it is, in hers, you've got the a nice symmetry between the this green and this green, which I don't have. Um, obviously, also there's a lot more. She pushed the values even darker than I did, and we could do that more in the face, but I've got to, to get running here, so I, I'm not gonna quite look at that. I don't have the time to do that. Let's just zoom in. Um. <laughs> One second here, kiddo. Um, so there's a close-up of the two of them side by side. Maybe I should brighten that up a little bit. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I wish I'd spent a little bit more time in here. Even giving a little bit more rosy cheeks on her face. But, you know, it is what it is. Let's just take a look elsewhere on here. Yeah, 
Again, there's a lot more purple in my grays. Versus this should be a little bit more cream. Oh, it looks like I've also made her a little bit thinner by... She could, that could come out a little bit more, right? I got somebody throwing a tantrum here. Um, okay. So. Here, come here, kiddo. Oh. We'll play with the laundry machine. Oh. Okay, looks like you had some fun today. Yeah, you're on camera. Yeah. yeah. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for painting. It's been a long painting day, and thank you to my family for being so patient. Somebody didn't have a nap today, so it's been, been a wild afternoon. And chocolate. And lots of chocolate from the Easter eggs. <laughs> okay, everybody, enjoy the rest of your evening, and happy Easter to, to those of you celebrating Easter, or Lent, or Passover, or, uh, is it Ramadan, I think, too? Okay, good night, everybody. Have a good night. We'll talk to you all soon.